My name is Yogapur Gaukar. For those who don't know me, I joined the School of Geography uh, at the beginning of this year in January. Uh, I came from across the canyon from the School of Natural Resources. And this sentence pretty much sums up my adult academic life. I've been trying to model urban hydrology, green infrastructure um, using the Agua Urban Tool and the Kineros model. And what it boils down to is using GIS and a hydrologic model to try and replicate the real world and see where it takes us. My work was part of a bigger uh, CNH project uh, with a bunch of other faculty on campus, uh, including Andrea, who's in, the, who's in this meeting as well, and some faculty and grad students from the School of Hydrology, Public Policy, Landscape Architecture as well. Um, so I was trying to give uh, inputs from the physical side of the natural system and see how it connects to the social side of things. Um, so not trying to rub it in too much, but this is what we missed um, this year when it comes to monsoons. We missed all the flooding on our streets. Um, hopefully it loads without a lot of problems. Okay, anyways, while it, while it tries to load, um, when it rains, we get a lot of water on our streets. And why is that? Because we don't have a well-established drainage system underground. And because there's so much water on the street, um, in, in this arid environment that we are, we look at opportunities on how we can try and use this water instead of just letting it go downstream. Um, so what can we do about that? And urban hydrology itself presents this unique challenge because we have so much impervious area that means not a lot of water is going in the ground but just flowing off our roofs of our uh, streets and driveways and just causing more havoc and nuisance flooding everywhere uh, so that's the start of my research trying to see how we can use this water prevent uh, conserve the water reduce flooding and whatnot so i talked about this a little bit um, in terms of what urban hydrology brings uh, we have more impervious area, that means less water is going in the ground, more is flowing off. And when it comes to understanding where most of the water is coming from, this graph is just showing you different areas of a watershed uh, from a rooftop all the way to a regional water course. And most of the water that's available to harvest or use is at that rooftop level. Um, so the two lines are one for an undeveloped watershed when there's no uh, impervious area. What happens? That's the pattern of runoff coming from the watershed and then the red line is uh, water coming off a developed watershed so there's more runoff coming off so in this area is where we can have most success in terms of harvesting water and that's where uh, green infrastructure comes into the picture and uh, prince george's county started uh, looking into these practices that they call source control practices trying to uh, harvest the water as it falls instead of waiting for it to come downstream somewhere as in, in a dam or something like that because that's been the trend over in our past, right? We try to stop water using a dam and try to use the water there for, for power, for irrigation and whatnot. But then why not try to use it at the source? It might be easier, it's more spread out, right? Uh, but the effectiveness of a green infrastructure practice is based on the objective. So if you wanna uh, reduce flooding, then you want the water to go into the ground as fast as possible. That's the best chance you have of reducing flood. Uh, and then if you want to use that water as an augmented source, then you want to capture it in your barrels and systems and use it in your houses if possible. So with these principles, we start looking at urban hydrology and it comes with its own challenges. You have a lot of level of detail. There's so much uh, difference in terms of your surfaces, right? Each, if you just look at your own house, you have your roof, you have your yard, you have your driveway. There's so much happening out there. So how do we bring all that into a model? And that was one of my first tasks, is try to see how we can do this in a model. Now, this is an example of high school watershed where half of the university is in, and we are right around here. Um, the water is to west, water on the streets. We always see that when there's a lot of rain happening. So I wanted to build a tool uh, to represent urban hydrology and also try to model green infrastructure at the same time. And that's where this Agua Urban Tool comes into the picture. So the Agua Tool by itself was already developed 
for natural watersheds, for modeling fire effects of fire um, in the urban component to it. So it's a GIS-based tool. You have all these forms that you fill out step by step and prepare hydrological models using readily available spatial GIS data, uh, geographic data. And the model we used was called the Kinneros model, which used differential equations to solve solve differential equations to calculate how water flows uh, downstream. But the good thing was it allowed you to represent each parcel at that small level. So you could represent roofs, driveways, and, um, your, and your yards as well. And I'll show you an example of that. But when it comes to GIS, what I started doing was started looking at LIDAR point clouds and trying to get elevation from that uh, and then use the elevation to determine how the water will flow in that small area. So this is at a very fine scale. You're looking at less than a meter resolution in terms of your DEM, and you get something like this, which is basically showing you the path the water is going to take derived from the elevation model that you have. And once you have that, the question is, how do I translate that into a model? So these uh, green lines right here was what came from the DEM. And this is the structure of uh, parcels. That is the data we use to model each and every house. And what I came up with was let's draw lines on these maps and let the model figure out how the water flows. So from here, this is what the model interprets and then solves those equations to understand how the water flows. The other aspect of GIS uh, in hydrological modeling is using land cover. Um, basically, you can use high resolution imagery and train the software to understand what roofs are, what roads are, uh, what water is, and then convert it into something that looks like this, which has a bunch of errors in the first pass, and then you process it again to smoothen out those errors, and then you end up with something like this, where you can start extracting those roofs, those trees, uh, streets and driveways. So now you have a representation of the area that you're trying to model. And I bring all of this into our model. Now, without going into too much details, I just want to show you two quick results that come out of modeling. So back to our high school watershed, we tried to model over 2,000 parcels um, in this watershed, and more than half of the area was impervious. And we do have a big uh, natural channel that goes through the watershed as well. The first part of the study was trying to run a design storm analysis. What that means is we look at uh, typical storms in, in our area. In this case, we looked at a storm that occurs that has the probability of occurring once in five years, once in 25 years, or once in 100 years. And um, we tried to model the way green infrastructure was spread out across the watershed. And I'll show you how it is spread out right now. Uh, but we also try to model what happens when you start increasing the number of green infrastructure in your watershed. And then how does the watershed look like when there's no impervious area at all? So the natural part of it as well. And start comparing these things to try and understand what we need to achieve. Because our final goal is trying to make the watershed look as if it was natural when there was no built up area. So these modeling results can try, try to give you some understanding of how to achieve that. Um, in this case, the model spits out peak flow, which is a time, uh, at a particular time stamp down the watershed, and how much water is going to be in total coming down the watershed as well. And what we realized that uh, the current GI implementation, which included uh, 175 basins spread out across the watershed and only 37 cisterns across the watershed, and this is, mind you, in, in a watershed that has 2,000 parcels, so that's not a lot of uh, GI, but it was it didn't make any difference. It was like around one percent change in terms of peak flow and volume. And even if we try to increase it by two times and five times, it still couldn't reach the uh, levels of pre-development, which was around forty percent reduction um, in terms of uh, uh, volume and peak flow. Going on to pretty pictures, basically if on the left right here, is the distribution of GI. Um, the, the oranges are all the basins, which is concentrated in the lower part of the watershed, just south of our university. And uh, most of the systems were on the west side of the water, uh, on the east side of the watershed spread across Sam Hughes. Um, and then the middle graphs, uh, the middle maps represent how much water is reduced off the streets in terms of total volume. Darker the color means more reduction. And uh, on the right is how much water is being captured by a cistern or being infiltrated in a basin. Darker the color, more the volume. So you can see there's um, 
there's relationship between where the basins are involved or where the cisterns are installed and how much reduction happens in those areas. And that's a very straightforward um, relationship. But the other relationship that came out was there was some accumulated downstream impact as well. So if we had cisterns up here, uh, you could see reduction in volume as you came down the watershed as well. And then as you randomly start placing more GI, you can see that impact compounds as well. Um, and that's what we observe. The second part of the study was basically looking at a 20 year analysis of how one particular house with a, a 1300 gallon cistern performs uh, when you have typical storms that you'll observe over a 20 year period. And we wanted to simulate uh, daily water use and see how much water is in the tank every day based on how much water we use. And so I have this graph that I charted out based on those 20 years. The first, the top part of the graph is 10 years, first 10 years, and the next is the next 10 years. The green is the water demand, that is the water used by irrigation in your house. And the orange is the amount of water that's in the cistern at any given day. Um, so there's a bunch of trends that come out. First, uh, the water demand is highest during the hottest months, May and June, which you can see in these peaks down here. Um, and then it's low during the cold uh, months of December and January and a little bit of February as well. Um, and then what we observed was after July, when our monsoons are supposed to hit, the cisterns start filling up. And then as you use the water, it goes down again and then goes com comes back again when there's a next storm in the uh, vicinity as well. So what we learned from this was if you size your cistern based on the roof that you have, you have capacity to fulfill around 60% of the water requirements throughout a year. It's only in the months of May and June is when you will have to use a little bit of water from, uh, from Tucson water to irrigate your lands or maybe not have plants during those times or rather uh, uh, crops during those times. But for the rest of the year, you still have those, you have water to work with. And interestingly, you can also see trends in what happens when there is not a lot of rainfall. Like for example, this year, we didn't have a big monsoon or no monsoon at all. And this is something that, ha that could happen. Um, let me see. Uh, it's this right here is what will happen. There's no rain, the system's not gonna fill up and then let's hope for winter water and then the system will fill up again and you can start using that water again. So take home message. If you have a big enough roof and you can capture the water, put a nice cistern above 1,000 gallons maybe, and you can survive uh, with that much extra water. So yeah, you can use that water. From where this came from, if you want to know more about what I've been doing, um, you can take a look at these papers. And on a lighter side, if you want to know more about me as a person and not my academic side, um, I learned carpentry for my cat. She's a good teacher. I also try to wonder about what it's like to live in the past uh, with limited technology. That could be awesome. And then I also like stories uh, from animals, apparently, and also try to pretend a desert tortoise sometimes. Um, but that's me. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yoga, there was one question in the in the chat box that maybe you could answer real quick. And I think it was about the, um, you were showing the, the nine maps. Um, and so John Rex in the chat box asked, were the three ro yes. rows there, uh, were those different storm models? Yes, sorry, I didn't get a lot of time to explain everything. But um, yeah, there were three different storms. They were the three design storms, the one in five uh, year, the second one was one in 25. And, uh, Oh, wait, no, sorry, uh, my bad. That was all one in 25 years, but the three rows corresponded to what was actually implemented in the watershed, what was two times the amount of GI, and then the last row was what would happen if you put five times the amount of GI that we had in that watershed. Yeah. Thanks.